Hello, and welcome to another edition of Gussied Up Magic, where we discuss everything strange, unusual, and macabre. I'm Pat Bizarre O'Keefe, one of the three Appalachian witches. The other two are Ashley and Misty. Unfortunately, they're not going to be able to be with us tonight, but they're here in spirit. So I'll be your host today. A special thanks to our producer, Wes Forsyth of Scarefest Radio. Reverend Patience is our uh, is our guest tonight. We're very excited to have her. She's an internationally known hoodoo spiritualist, psychic medium, paranormal consultant, and investigator. She is a spiritual life coach advisor, natural health coach, and teacher of folk magic. She has quite an extensive uh, resume. Now, she is also an ordained man- minister with the Universal Life Church since 2001. And she's been a certified natural health coach through Pi or Pi. Is it Pi or Pi? Pi. Pi. Pi Wellness Academy since 2020. Her expertise is in natural health coaching, psychic mediumship, spiritualism, and dealing with the paranormal professionally for over 30 years. Welcome, patients. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have me on the show. I mean, y'all have been on my show several times. Yes. And the, when you, you know, message me as like, oh my gosh, fangirl, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we fangirl right back and and tell our audience a little bit about your program. My program is um, Spiritual Tea Time with Reverend Patience on my company, Indigo Psychics Facebook page. Um, We just talk about anything and everything. um, It's to show how we are more... um, alike than we are different that's why i try to bring different people besides our you know other fellow um spiritual advisors from indigo psychics on the show we you know talk about you know different spiritual topics and then if people are good little boys and girls may throw some cards or do some you know intuitive readings for them and everything you know just to give them a little spice of something and we sell um fresh roasted coffees and um loose leaf teas and um, everything is 100% all natural. Um, we're the world's first psychic coffee company, actually. And uh, just uh, just to note, we uh, it's the official tea of our seances that we're doing right now. We we did one at the Trivet Clinic, and it was sold out very quickly. Uh, and people had nothing but good to say about the tea that we use. So we actually Amen. do a an old uh, fashioned Victorian tea, and um, we use we use those particular teas from Indigo Psychics, and then we present an old fashioned Victorian seance. And by the way, for anyone who's interested, we're going to be doing another one of those on November 2nd at the Trivet Clinic. So we're looking forward to that. Now, you're a hoodoo practitioner, a hoodoo spiritualist. Yes, ma'am. For folks that don't know what that is, could you uh, could you tell them? Hoodoo is um, African-American um, folk tradition that was started by um, the ancestors that were um, slaves in this country. Um, they had to mix their various um, traditions and everything um, and hide it behind um, the, you know, Christianity and um, so that they wouldn't get in trouble. And then, a lot, you know, and then as different runaway slaves, you know, got mixed up with, you know, the different tribes, they, you know, took on some of their spirituality, mostly, um, you know, to a lot of people because they don't realize that, it is a part of our African-American culture of our country and everything. And so a lot of people think that, you know, just anybody, you know, could come in and just start practicing like, you know, you know, some Yankee come up into the mountains claiming that they're a mountain witch, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) And, but if you go, especially down in the Bible belt anywhere, you know, first Sunday, you know, the women are still wearing the white, like traditionally, you know, to honor Yamaya, mm-hmm. you know, which is considered the mother of the ocean and everything. Um, we used various different forms of um, folk magic. And um, and a lot of it also, too, because of, you know, being predominantly in the South. And um, like I said, hiding behind, you know, because so, you know, our ancestors wouldn't get beat by master. But now, even so, in the Bible Belt, they still, you know, have to hide so they can still be in plain open, you know, like how, a, a, you know, traditional witches use spells. We use the Bible. 
because we revere it as a very powerful magical book. And so, you know, because especially like when, you know, folks are not used to me and they'll see me, they know I'm a witch, but they start seeing me putting Bible verses and not realizing that's a spell, baby, you know, and because of trend and everything, you know, everyone wants to, you know, knows about the Psalms, but true practitioners know that the whole book is a spell book, all the Bible verses and everything. And it's very similar, you know, to like the mountain traditions of Appalachia and everything, you know, because, you know, because of that strong, you know, my way or the highway Christian mindset, you couldn't be flat out saying, oh, I'm a witch and I do this and everything you you had to hide. And so it's the same way thing, you know, with the hoodoo tradition and everything. It, it's a, like I said, it's a various mixture of, you know, the different African traditions. You know, some people put a little bit of like, you know, dealing with, you know, the Bodu or the Ifa, you know, because depending on where your ancestors came from Africa, you know, dealing with the um, Bodu would be the Loas, Ifa would be um, the Orishas. In Latin cultures, um, they have their own version of it called Santaria, um, especially like in Puerto Rico and everything, um, Cuba, you know, in the Caribbean and stuff. And then, um, like I said, with the various different um, Native American tribes, and then even with some of them, because of where they're landed, they even picked up, you know, different traditions of, you know, using the Kabbalah because of having, you know, Jewish heritage within them. So it's a nice variety. And so growing up learning those different traditions and everything and then also studying on different cultures because of how mixed i am and everything because of having the african the native american and the european traditions and it's like wait a second when it comes to folk magic y'all are using the same tools and everything you know, because no matter what culture you go to, you know, the way your grandma used to um, pray over the garlic, you know, to help mm -hmm. protect the house, you know, it's the same, no different than a little Italian Nona doing the same thing or your abuelita, you know, doing the same thing or your um, Nana doing the same thing. They're all using it for, you know, spiritual cleansing, but also for healing, you know. So that's one thing I love about being of, you know, a hoodoo practitioner is the being able to incorporate the different um, traditions of my ancestors because that's what it's mainly about because because of having you know the voodoo and you know the, the ifa you know traditions you know embedded in a lot of it everyone especially the voodoo part you know get those two confused not realizing hoodoo is a spiritual practice and voodoo itself it is a completely separate religion that's African based that comes from West Africa. And granted we have those roots and everything, but a lot of us who are practitioners don't belong to the church because a lot of us, especially when it comes to our spiritual gifts, we're a little too much for, you know, the prayer warriors and the keepers of the prayer closets, even though, you know, like I tell people, the church is full of, you know, witches left and right, even though they use different terms and everything. So, I'm, I'm very proud to be able to represent the culture because too many, you know, people are, are like I said, um, gatekeeping in a negative way instead of, you know, showing people, you know, I respect that you want to learn about this, but, but here, you know, here's something simpler that's closer to your own ancestor. Cause that's what it main thing we're about is mm -hmm. ancestor, um, exoneration and everything mm -hmm. and, you know, and honoring the, the traditions of your ancestors. Let me ask, uh, and uh, you know, I agree on a level, <clears throat> on a level with what you just said. What if someone would come to you and say, there is something I am, I'm drawn to this. I truly feel that I may have a past life connection with this. And then they may, inter uh, you know, they may tell you that they've interacted with the ancestors in, in quite the same way that you do. In other words, they show signs that there may be a connection there. Um, do you think that the door would be open to someone like that? Oh, yeah. Uh, to the spiritual path. When I tell people and everything, when it comes to especially, you know, to spirituality in general, spirit does not see color at all. That's a man-made concept. Mm -hmm. As long as 
you were coming with a humble heart and you shown that love and respect to that ancestor and you're honoring them and respecting them mm-hmm. to, um, in, in the way they want to be honored and respected. That's what matters. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, like, you know, how, especially like born again, hypocrites want to worry about everyone else's sins. It's the same way with that when it comes to your spiritual relationship and everything. Worry about your own relationship is what I tell people. Because what mm-hmm. I have with my aunt, because, oh, trust me, believe me, growing up being mixed, especially on my social media over the years, I have dealt with all different types of racism, you know, dealing in the spiritual and magical communities because mm-hmm. I'm not white enough or European enough, you know, to be practicing that type of, you know, um, or honoring that type of um, God or goddess. Well, um, you're not black enough for this. You're not Latino enough for this. You're not native mm-hmm. for this. And it, and it's like, excuse me. That's why just recently I posted the updated, you know, thing from Ancestry.com showing, um, excuse me, <laughs> you see what I got, honey? You know? <laughs> well, what is your background? Because people are going to want to know now that you mentioned it, your ancestral um, background. Well, from my, okay, actually, hold on. Let me look it up right. real quick. Okay. <laughs> That'd be the easiest way to do it. Because <laughs> the up because ever since um the company BlackRock um bought Ancestry.com, they have access now to um ancient DNA. And so certain things we thought we were, it's like, oh, mm-hmm. it, it go a little more in depth. It's like, oh, that's where that root came from. It's like, uh, mm-hmm. okay. So let me see here. Do, do, do. Okay. I am 20% Scottish, 19% Spanish, um, 12% English, Northwestern European, 11% Germanic um, European, um, 10% Indigenous Puerto Rico, which is um, the Taino Arawak, um, 7% um, Portuguese, 7% Irish, 2% Nigerian, 2% North African, 2% Wales, 1% um, um, Senegal, 1% Benin and Togo, and then 1% Nigerian East Central Nigerian, and then um, 1% um, Cameroon, Congo, and Western Bantu peoples. And then I have uh, 1% Southern Bantu peoples, 1% Finnish, 1% um, Eastern European and Russian, which we broke down and found out that's actually Anas- Anasazi um, Jewish. Mm-hmm. And um, the Anasazi actually, uh, which is Yiddish for saying um, German dis- um, oriented, because um, back in the medieval times, the tribe of Judah, Judah had settled in Germany. And then when the big, you know, it's um, purge happened around the time of the Crusades, half of them went to Spain and became the, um, the Sephardic Jews, which is Yiddish means Hispanic origin. And then the rest of them uh, went to Russia. And a lot of them actually live in St. Petersburg and um, Moscow. And then I'm 1% Basquette, which originally we thought was French. Interesting. Uh, is your, uh, do you know your, um, your blood uh, type, uh, whether it's an RH negative or an RH positive? Because I'm, RH, is- I'm type O positive. O positive, but your one percent, uh, the Basque region of between France, France and Spain, is yes. where you know that that region has like a thirty six percent Rh negative factor in its population in in their blood types, which is fascinating because national or internationally, I think it's like six uh, percent uh, total, which uh, which I you know there's definitely a, a discrepancy there between what their blood type is and then and, you know, uh, go out into the world and find out that only 6% in other nations and uh, specific nations, you know, have that uh, blood, uh, uh, that blood uh, RH uh, factor. And what's interesting about it is they say that, you know, RH, well, especially O negative, the RH uh, factor in O, it's the, what they call the bloodline of the gar- gods. If you have an RH factor, uh, your blood, t- your blood can't be um, cloned or 
you know, nope. you can't be cloned, which is really interesting. And uh, they don't know where it came from, this uh, RH factor, which I, I think is fascinating. You mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, your ancestors in Puerto Rico. Now, you mentioned a tribe. So that's a very indigenous uh, people to Puerto Rico. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. The, the Taino actually had a large empire. They were um, from Española, which is, you know, Haiti and Dominican, Puerto Rico, and um, also southern part of Florida. And um, my family um, comes from the, I think it's called Juca area of Puerto Rico. And um, and actually come to find out, um, we were, my ancestors were the um, medicine people of the tribe, the priests and priestesses. Now, you have such a, a background and connections with so many different cultures. Which one speaks to you the most or which several speak to you the most? All of them, actually, mm -hmm. because I was adopted out of my family and everything because um, my birth um, giver was um, family was the clan. And um, so when um, she, they found out she was pregnant with me, as um, when I was 17, my great grandma told me I was an abomination of God because my grandfather, I mean, excuse me, my father was a Spanish speaking N word. And um, it's just, I find it hilarious because um, the different cultures and everything growing up, trying to find out who I was, I, you know, was so drawn to different, you know, areas, you know, especially during medieval times, you know, from anywhere, you know, dealing of my, uh, of Europe and, you know, and then like my, the African cultures and the native. And then when, you know, we get the DNA test and it's, it's like, oh, this explains a lot why I've been drawn to this and drawn to that. Yes. And, you know, like, um, down in Florida, I'm originally from, in Palm Beach County, we have a very large Jewish community and everything. And I mean, so much so that on high holidays, the public schools are closed down, no different than the regular federal holidays. I mean, at Christmas time, you see actually more Hanukkah de decorations and everything. And um, I and I just found it interesting how I was always drawn to that. And then um, also, too, my adopted family were Shriners. And I found out York Rite, Shriners, and Scottish Rite Masons run in my birth family. And mm -hmm. I'm also married to now, a, uh, my husband is a 32nd Scottish Rite and Knights Templar. And it's like, this is very interesting. And then as I started, especially like when I was learning about my Jewish heritage, mm -hmm. to come to find out to belong to the tribe of Judah means that you come from the line of King Solomon, King David mm -hmm. and Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And I had always, because of being so naturally gifted spiritually, because I was born with the um, what they call the cow, the veil mm -hmm. over the face. When it came to like anything malevolent or demonic, I had a natural command over them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And everything. Mm -hmm. and what, yeah, in the mountains, you're exactly right. It means that you were born with the ability to walk between the worlds. So to be able to recognize evil and then to have evil recognize you very easily. And, and by that, I mean, it's it's a vibrational thing. It's like people who have had near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. They become uh, often, you know, it becomes much easier for them to connect to the dead because they were there and there's a vibrational tracking system, if you will, or yes. it seems to be. And so the same, same with uh, the idea of the, uh, the cow. Oh, interesting. Believe me, it was not fun growing up and everything because the home that I grew up in in Florida was built on a Seminole burial ground and civil war battlefield. And nice. so you had to be all those spirits going on. I mean, sometimes it would get, it got so bad at, at one point in time, the pastor of my parents' Pentecostal church had to come out at least once a month to pray over, you know, do the holy oil and, you know, say the Psalms and prayers, of, you know, the St. Michael and all them and um, to, to keep things calm. Because at first, you know, they didn't want to believe it, even though, you know, my adoptive grandfather, um, because, you know, being the Shriner and, you know, dealing with the occult, he knew I had the gifts. I, he had 22 grandchildren. I was the only one adopted. And I'm the one who has showed 
being the most gifted in that area. And because I always wondered why I was Grandpa Jay's, you know, you know, favorite on that part. Because when he was dying, when I was eight years old, I'm the only grandchild he requested to see. And then, of course, I wasn't able to physical see him because that's back in the 80s when, you know, 12 and under, you couldn't go in you know, because of childhood diseases and all that stuff. So he ended up passing and he came to me in the middle of the night and told me a little, you know, message to tell my grandmother. Well, my grandparents are, you know, especially my grandma, Mary, being old school um, Cherokee lady from Eastern Band there in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, she would always say that they had relations. Well, when they had relations, they would call each other Big Daddy and Baby Girl. Well, he says for me to tell her, tell your grandma, Big Daddy says, it's not your time, you know, because I need you to be there for the grandkids and everything. When the time is right, I'll come for you, but I'll always be with you. You'll always be my baby girl, and I'm watching over you. So when I relayed that message, they're all looking around, especially my grandmother, all freaked. How does that baby know that? Because they never spoke about that stuff. They never even showed affection in front of nobody. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And everything. Yeah, old school. <laughs> yes, very old school, you know. And so all of a sudden, I'm being taken to church, you know, having prayer team lay hands on me, trying to break all forms of hereditary witchcraft and psychic abilities and the gift of prophecy and this and demonology, you name it, you know, they were trying to pray it away. Mm -hmm. And once I became an adult and, you know, and, you know, went, Mostly the reason why I became an ordained ordained minister was to shut my mama up because I was constantly getting guilted about not going to church <laughs> and making her realize I could still be a child of God mm -hmm. and not go to church, mama. You know, like in mm -hmm. Acts 17, I am the temple. Mm -hmm. He's not found in the bricks, you know. And so once I became an ordained minister and her and I got to talking, and I made her realize that, you know, like her little church lady group, the Morning Glories, is actually a coven of Christian witches. You got to call yourself prayer warriors and keeper of the prayer closet. And the reason why they're called the Morning Glories, because petunias come in different shades and colors. They come in all different race and backgrounds, but they're also Catholic and Protestant. And to show that, you know, they, even though they have their different churches they go to, they come together, you know, with the love of Christ to be able to minister to the old folk. Cause that's what they would do is go to the different nursing homes and sing like old timey songs and do little skits and everything, you know, and minister and visit with them. And so I had to go with them and everything. And as I started paying attention to them and I started, you know, really studying, you know, especially in the craft, you know, of the different European traditions and stuff. I was like, wait a second, mama, do you realize what you guys are doing, it's like when you guys are not ministering in the nursing homes, you get around together to sell uh, once a month on off time around the full moon to celebrate your birthdays. And then mm -hmm. you write each other's names down on prayer lists at your church for praying and everything. And, and, you know, and all that kind of thing. And, but once she realized that and because when, when she got really religious, because, you know, they had fun back in the 60s and 70s, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when my, as I say, when Mama became a born-again Reaganite back in the 80s, you know, everything stopped. One minute, like Halloween coming up. That was fun. You know, we had a big, you know, ha big harvest Halloween, you know, celebration at the one little church we used to go to. But when Mama started going to this one Pentecostal church, it's the devil's holiday. It's this, you know, everything evil mm -hmm. you could think of. And then I started making her do a research and started realizing, Mom, this is actually um, a Christian holiday started by the church to convert to pagans. It has nothing to do with the devil. It's about honoring your ancestors, especially look at your Irish roots. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, the conical hat that the witches wear. Look mm -hmm. at your German roots, Mom, because my adopted mama is um, has a B um, Bavarian German in her. I said, that's where it came from. That means you were a brewmeister. That means that you made beer. And what started the witch trials back in the medieval times in Germany, the monks were jealous of the women who made beer because they made better beer than them. So what's the best way to get rid of the competition? They started accusing them of witches. And that actually, it's a pagan woman's hat. Like I said, the brewmeister. Mm -hmm. 
would wear that, both men and women. Mm -hmm. And so now she has these cute little witches around the house during Halloween. (laughs) Well, let me ask, uh, do you believe in what we call closed practices? Or do you think that that is something that uh, an individual seeker could decide for themselves as long as they went into it, like you said, with an open heart, an open mind, and truly feeling drawn to that particular practice? Um, To me, closed practices is based on racism. As long as you come showing that, like I said, that proper love and respect, if, if that spirit and that you know because that's because of reincarnation and everything you know that's why we're drawn to certain especially ancient cultures and they're especially Mm -hmm. their spiritual practices is is witches and everything that um it's it's like i said as long as you are doing things in proper context and showing that love and respect and doing the rituals as you're supposed to be doing and everything and not just you know because to me cultural appropriation is just taking what you want and then perverting it, you know, in a disrespectful way. But as long as you're showing that love and respect, because, you know, I have good friends of mine that are devout Buddhists, but they're not black, Mm -hmm. but they were born and raised in Africa. Yeah. You know, and the, 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 cause like I said, if that, if those spirits, those gods or goddesses Mm -hmm. call you, to start working with them, your that's your relationship with them. And as long as, you, like I said, you're doing it in perfect love and perfect trust and respect, and, you know, and how you're supposed to be working with them, that's what matters. Mm-hmm. There's always going to be someone who's going to be coming in gatekeeping and everything on mm-hmm. the different, you know, traditions and practices because mm-hmm. they don't want someone. Oh, you're the wrong skin tone. You're this. You're that. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay. And because, like I said, like one year, I had a lady tell me I wasn't a real witch because I wasn't wicked. Oh, that's that. Look, oh, yeah. I, I have to mention, I have to mention something here. You know, Wicca, you you mentioned the difference between voodoo and hoodoo, right? A hoodoo being a spiritual practice and voodoo being a religion. Wicca is a religion. The craft is a spiritual practice. Exactly. Such a difference. Exactly. Oh, I, I I tick off the fluff bunnies a lot because I'm always calling them out on that and everything. Okay. I would tell them they're just as inflexible as the Christians. Because a lot of them are into that, and that's the problem. They still have that you know my way or the highway mentality, and there's the same with the African traditions and everything. But the problem because of the internet, so many have perverted it. And, you know, and it's this way or the highway type thing. And you have to do exactly as I said, excuse me. That's why it's called spirituality. You're being spiritually led Mm -hmm. and everything. That's one thing I love about the Universal Life Church. They recognize all paths to the divine, Mm -hmm. whether you call Mm -hmm. he, she, it, God, whatever. It's it's up Mm -hmm. to you. Your relationship with divine source is your business. As long as you're feeding, uh, treating your fellow human beings like Christ treated everybody with love and respect, that's all that matters, you know. And that's the way I see it when it comes to you know whatever spiritual path that, or um, that you want to belong to. And so many of them, you know, the fluff bunnies want to, you know, like I said, you know try to say that their way is the true way. I said, honey, Wicca ain't been around that long. And besides, if you really look into the guy that started it, he was a throw out. Like you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think he was a postman and uh, not, not taking away uh, anything about this, but um, uh, you know, and he did draw from, or tried to draw from uh, ancient practices. Uh, there's not a lot out there. And why is that? It's because every conquering nation erases, you know, most of the traces of other cultures. And a big part of that is their religion. So oh, it's yeah. very difficult to find out about the actual practices of our forebears, you know, uh, the Druids, for example. We know certain things about them, but we don't know their practices in whole, which is uh, truly a shame. But 
you mentioned ancestor worship, no, not worship, uh, although it is considered that uh, in, in voodoo, is it not? That, that uh, an ancestor can go from being a human soul to becoming more than that. Is, is that correct or did I read that wrong? It, again, it depends on what part. I mean, if it's you're going from the African voodoo tradition or the Haitian or the New, New Orleans and everything, mm -hmm. it, um, it's mostly, you know, it's because like a lot of the, if you look look back on either dealing with the Loa or the Orishas, they're actually not gods or goddesses. They were real people that were here mm -hmm. back in ancient times and they're exalted ancestors. Mm-hmm. But because, like I said, because of trends in the internet now, people are calling them gods and goddesses, and that's that's the main thing. Is I like I tell mm -hmm. people, it's about exoneration. It's not that we're worshiping; it's that we are thanking them and honoring them for doing the hard work that they did while they were alive, and also doing the hard work of providing and protecting for us from from the other side and everything. You know, that's why I tell people. Um, doing ancestral work and everything it is in all ancient cultures and because of certain western religions not honoring that anymore and everything is the reason why i strongly believe seeing the the deterioration of the family unit because children are not being raised to honor their ancestors so they don't have because they don't have that type of honor for the ancestors. They don't have that honor for the people of who are still alive, like they used to and everything, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, but if you don't, know, like you go to like certain cultures, like, especially like in Asia and everything, th they're terrified to upset the ancestors because they know they're going to get that spiritual spanking. And like mm -hmm. with certain, you know, traditions, you know, like at like I said, out of Africa and you know in the South and everything that or like Native Americans as well, you know about like I said honoring the ancestors. They don't want to upset them because they know even though the physical body is not there, they can still reach out and touch you when you're being a naughty child. And that's why it's so important to keep that proper you know relationship and everything, and not just calling on them like a spoiled child only when you need something. And never given a you know, prayer of gratitude, never given that offering of thanks because, you know, they provided for you in your time of need or protected you in your time of need. And I've seen, too, especially these youngins now these days, you know, and then they come crying to you. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Well, what did you do? Uh, I didn't do. I. Well, what do you expect? You know, they feel disrespected. They're going to show it to you, you know, especially the old school ones. Because, you know, that's the main thing I tell them. I don't care what your ancestry is. If you're going to start working with the ancestors, you've got to remember, now, no matter how old your physical body gets, you still need to be coming to them in the humble heart of a child because you are still a child to them. And let me mention, too, uh, even even for those who practice on the side of the craft, when you approach your work with a humble heart, is when you are going and, and if you uh, if you focus your work too on others so that you're doing service i have seen so much more positive you know outcomes of manifestation than if it's just about me unless it's something i truly need not what i want but what i need i i totally agree on that i totally agree on that that's like like for myself i yeah i, I constantly every day light a prayer candle of protection but i've it's not for me because mm -hmm. one thing i've learned what it because of the law of reciprocity whatever i need in my life i'll pray and wish on for others so that's why i'm always praying protection for my beloveds that's why i'm always praying for good health and wealth and happiness for them so that what you know i'm praying for them comes back on me especially during these retrogrades honey Woo. You see all these okay. fools, it doesn't matter if you're hoodoo or the craft, you see these people working from ego, and then they wonder why things are popping off in the wrong way and having these major tower card moments, as they would say, is because this is the, you know, one a year eight, and then you have all these planets in retrograde, especially now that Pluto is back in Capricorn until November, Chad, 
It's like, that's the last thing I want is to try to do anything wrong by anybody. I want to do as many blessings I can for other folk. So that blessings come back to me and my beloved so we can live our best life deliciously, you know, while helping others. You see, I a method that. behind my madness, as they would say. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back. Right. And if, if someone were interested in traveling the hoodoo spiritualist or spiritualism path, what what advice would you give for uh, to them? Um, do your research and search out an elder in the, in the community that's a teacher. But make sure that you come respectful because a lot of elders in the hoodoo community are old school and everything. And you must have you know, have that, you know, big mama Medea type attitude and everything. So you better come correct and um, be, you know, ready to learn. Um, a lot of them are old school um, oral tradition because, you know, having to hide and everything. Um, there aren't too many books out there. And unfortunately, a lot of the books that are out there um are not written by traditional hoodooists that, and um, that's why I highly recommend by finding someone who um, is an old school practitioner um, that of, of the oral tradition, because you're really going to learn, you know, the old ways and everything, but prepare to do the work because so many of these younger generations that are coming to either hoodoo the craft and all that, want a quick fix, especially, you know, things that, you know, instantaneous, you do things one time and that's it. And part of the, you know, especially, you know, because of us mostly working with the ancestors, it's a daily process. It's a daily thing. And granted, you know, in modern times, we don't always have the time to um, be lighting candles and incense. The whole point is you still having that verbal um, saying your prayers and everything and um, with your ancestors, you know, saying prayers of gratitude and, you know, every morning and every night before I, I when I wake up or before I go to bed, I always thank my ancestors for providing for us. And I go down the list of every little thing and people are like, why do I need to do that? Why do I have to be thankful for the little things? Because if you're not thankful for the little things, how do you expect the ancestors to bless you with the big things? Because you, if you can show to them that you have that stewardship of the little things and blessings in your life, then they will have no problem giving you those bigger blessings. And another thing that I love about hoodoo and everything, um, because especially in these modern times, everyone thinks that you have to have all these, you know, potpourri looking candles done up and all these little fancy and expensive tools. And it wasn't like that. The ancestors didn't have that. You use what you got. I don't, I'm many a times I've had students, you know, come to me and it's go to your kitchen. You cook, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Go into the kitchen, open up your spice rack. And I start, go, give me a list of what you got, what you cook with baby. And I'll start telling them exactly, you know, okay, this herb is for this, this, and this. This herb is for that, that, you know, because um, what the craft would call kitchen witchery, that's a big part of it. Because not everything is about, you know, um, always lighting a candle because you weren't mm -hmm. able to. Because a lot of people who do practice and everything are not able to be out in the open. But you can hold your Bible out and say a quick prayer as you're making, you know, a big mm -hmm. um, batch of soup to heal the family. You know, like anytime in my family, when they get sick, they'll look right at me. So, Can you make your famous penicillin in the uh, bowl, which they call my chicken noodle soup. Yes. And so when I'm making that and the whole thing is, is putting that intent in your food mm -hmm. 
and everything. That's why when you get comfort food, that's why I always laugh when people call it soul food and everything. Soul food is from any culture. That's any food that's made with love, as I call it, because you're putting that healing and love intent into the food because you want to see that person be happy and joyous because of the food that you make or feeling better because of the food that you make and everything. And, and not realizing that a lot of things, you know, that all our foods and all of our spices not, not only makes things taste good, but have also medicinal and spiritual uses. And once you learn that stuff, you start getting understanding the concept of so above, so below, so within, mm -hmm. so without, um, without. And people don't realize a lot of things are not just about the external. You also got to do about the internal. And that's like I said, you can take your magic in by the food you eat. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things that we learn. Like, you know, not only in the hoodoo tradition, but especially like with the Italians and everything, they always tell you, be careful about whose gravy or spaghetti you eat, especially if she's a single woman, because they'll put their period blood in the spaghetti sauce, the hoodoo okay. you do to them. Like I had one little girl... Every single relationship, she was doing this to these fools. Not trying to get to know them first to make sure that they were the right one. And, of course, mm -hmm. she was attracting all these very abusive and toxic people. And wondering why they were going obsessively crazy over her mm -hmm. and not in a good way and everything. Because, mm -hmm. like, I, you know, would try to tell these babies, you know, you learn this stuff to help. When you start using it for selfish reasons, especially when it comes to the love situation, that's not love anymore. You're trying to dominate somebody. You're trying to force somebody to be with you. Yes. That's not love, you know, and then you wonder why it's not working because you're sitting there having to constantly reinforce it and reinforce it, especially if you're trying to use love magic to take somebody away from somebody and everything. Mm -hmm. And then you're wondering why your health is going, your beauty's going, because you're spending all that energy trying to, you know, force somebody to be with you mm -hmm. instead of letting mm -hmm. it naturally happen. Well, not only that, when you're using, the, when you're using that kind of intent where you're overcoming or trying to overcome someone's free will, which, which is what you're doing, instead of attracting that positive energy, which love should be about, what you're doing is you're bringing forth negative energy and negative energy is never going to manifest something positive for you. Um, and, and you're exactly right. Uh, you know, the best thing to do is to give it Unto God, unto divine energy, as, as I call this energy, and ask for the energy that is supposed to be with you. And and why do I say that? Because if the only thing that you're going to be happy with, the only thing is, uh, you know, is somebody who's tall, dark, and handsome. If if that's a true need and it's internalized and it doesn't come from a bad place, it's just where it's been so internalized to you, then that's what, you know, what I have seen be sent to people. But always remember, it's what they bring inside of themselves that will complete you. And we mm -hmm. all know that in relationships after after you know they say seven years even if you're highly enamored with someone after seven years m many relationships will break down that were not founded in a deeper meaning than just the physical or money yeah. or you see what i'm saying things that, yeah. that were not coming from the spirit amen that's very true that's very true like i'm I, i'm proud to say that i'm married to my fourth and favorite husband you know, he's my best friend because my first three, you know, it, it just it's like the same malevolent, demonic type abusive energy, but different body. And it was just you getting know, I, worse and worse, you know, because I, I had to realize what inside of me I need because we're walking magnets. And I had to realize and recognize what was causing me to magnetize these negative abusive relationships. And once I started working on that and everything, I finally, you know, in my heart after my third divorce realized, you know what? I am ready. I am a good person. I am a good woman and I deserve to have my true love. I have seen it happen. I have married plenty of couples that are still um, happily married today after 20 something years of marriage or just as much as in love. I know that is real. I deserve it. And, that's one of the things 
you know, to use as a modern tool. That's why I'm always, you know, pressing the, the babies to use their social media like a vision board and be careful for what, you know, you're posting and everything because tapping mm -hmm. into the internet, you're tapping it into the spiritual world mm -hmm. at the same time. And so I didn't realize right after my third, um, I had started posting because, um, when I have my hair and makeup done, I've been told I've been compared to Morticia, you know, and the funny thing is my husband that I'm married to now has always been compared to Gomez. Okay. And I, I started this. posting, not realizing this is before Facebook started doing <laughs> the memory thing. You know, a year ago you posted blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I started posting once a month, not realizing I was doing it once a month. It was a picture of Raul Julia and Angelica Houston from the movie saying, screw Romeo and Juliet. I want to love like um, Gomez and Marticia. And I would write above it. I want my Gothic cowboy version of Gomez, or I'm still searching, you know, for my Gothic cowboy version of Gomez. And then it was when I, you know, went out and like I said, it was a full moon night and I, you know, just had that big old catharsis and everything. And just, you know, um, one thing um, for the um, divine feminine, I always referred to her as big mama or holy mother Mary, you know, I use her aspect and I'm crying out the big mama. And it's like, because, you know, and everything about it. And after I was done, I get a friend request and it was him. And I'm looking at him like, oh, okay. So I accept. And I'll start looking down and everything. He literally has a picture of him, of Raul Julia from the movie and him. And the only way you can tell the difference between their pictures is my hubby has gray eyes and Raul has brown eyes. And then you go further down. Remember I asked for the gothic cowboy version? He mm -hmm. had about 20 different profile pictures of him wearing the black cowboy hat. I went outside. I looked up at the, I said, big mama. I love you. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> and we've been together ever since. I'm actually his fourth and favorite wife. And we talked about, you know, if we realized because the type of people we were um, when we were younger and everything, if we had met back then before we went through the, our major relationships in our lives, we would have killed each other. The type of people we were. I know the type of monster I used to be. And everything I would have chewed him up, spit him out without even thinking twice. But thankfully, like I said, we learned our lessons and worked on the healing and everything. And I'm married to my best friend. And that's, and I try to always tell these babies coming up, you know, that's what you need to build. Because so what? You're attractive, you're lusting after them. That, like you said, after the seventh year, that lust wears off. And then if you ever start realize all you had from the main basis was the SEX, the sacred energy exchange between you two, that wears out after a while. If you don't have that foundation of friendship, you can't have that foundation of trust and communication and understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started first. We actually met online. I was living in Florida. He's in Minnesota. And we were talking for months and getting to know each other and everything mm -hmm. before we even went on our first physical date. And everything. And we've been together now 10 years. Well, what did you think when you first saw him? Wee. <laughs> All right, ladies out there, you just heard it. Make sure when you do that manifestation, you ask to bring the person that was supposed to be matched with you that truly does complete you in a spiritual sense. And you're going to be going woo he too. <laughs> Oh yeah, I have oh, a similar yeah. story. I I feel yeah, I do. And uh, and within two weeks, he was brought to me, and we've been together ever since. So it's it's a beautiful thing, love is. I'm gonna move real quick though, uh, because I want to be able to to touch on this. Now, you're a very strong medium. Tell tell me, uh, tell us the the. And I'm sure there's many, but there's usually one or two stories that really stand out where you have used that gift to to move someone's world, so to speak, to to give them peace and and to, to make them, uh, well, simply sleep better at night, knowing that their loved ones are OK. So that story. One of my favorite is um, a thrift store I used to work at. Um, I 
work with people who are on the spectrum and in dis um, dis have physical disabilities. And the company I was had um, a thrift store with it, which was training ground for them. And it's right on the crossroads. And plus, you're always getting haunted stuff. And I had this, it was right after we reopened and right after the um, pandemic and everything. And this lady came in, she was just in tears, absolute tears. And I mean, of course, you know, I'm a bleeding heart, you know. And so it's like, man, what's wrong? And she started telling me about how her, um, she had just come from the hospital. Her mama had just passed away to the complications of the COVID. And, um, but unfortunately, because of things being closed down, her brothers and sisters could not afford to give her the funeral she wanted. Especially the urn, because her mama wanted to be cremated, and the urn she wanted was like, shoot, like ten thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? And she started describing it to me, and as soon as she started describing it to me, there we had a spirit of the lady named Miss Cora, and every time she would come to corporalize, you would always smell maple syrup like on fresh hotcakes. You know what I'm saying? And as this lady's describing it, I could hear the, you know, her telling me, go show her my urn. Her own family got rid of her urn after they dumped, you know, her ashes. But of course, they didn't properly clean it. And it was still a little bit of her was in it. So that's why she was there in the store. And so I said, OK, OK, I got you. And so I said, ma'am, I think I got something that could help you out. I took her down to where it was. We were selling it for $3 and 75 cents. And she, mind you now, I had not seen the picture at all of what the urn, she just described it to me that it was um, like um, Japanese Asian, you know, had the cherry blossoms on it with the 24 karat gold inlay and, you know, you know, fancy Asian, you know, type porcelain that they make them out of. And lo and behold, it was exactly the one that she wanted exactly to the T and it was $3 and 75 cents brand new. If they had bought it, it would have been about $10,000 because of the 24 gar um, 24 karat inlay that it had on it and everything. And so having, being able to help people with that and everything, you know, and use those gifts to help people, you know, it just made my heart sing because seeing the smile on her face, because they went from tears of sadness to tears of joy, being able to use my gifts to help people with that. It's the biggest gratification ever and everything. And, and I truly feel that certain people are given these gifts because they have this innate knowledge that they do need to help. And have you noticed that people who have a gift and if they don't do it from their heart, it's like they either start losing it or they start losing themselves. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And what's scary is now a lot of these babies coming up have the Claire Audient gift. Because I've been seeing a lot of these uh, friends of my stepdaughter. She's Gen Z. And these babies are on schizophrenia uh, medications left and right. Because they're being told that they're crazy. This is not real. And that's the problem. Because I've always studied on psychology since high school. And mixing of the spiritual and the psychology. And I've worked with um, different people in the psychology background. Mental health and everything. And they're starting to realize. People who have been diagnosed with the schizophrenia and everything. Do have undiagnosed clairaudient um, gifts and because not having proper protection to do, you know, and know how to use discernment to know what is their thoughts and spirits' mm -hmm. thoughts, malevolent entities like to take advantage of them, and of course they go crazy. Like mm -hmm. for instance, um, before I started um, working um, in adult foster care, I used to help my husband um, before the pandemic. Um, he was a general manager of a beauty supply chain down in um, Minneapolis in the twin cities. And I had this one lady who used um, the big mental hospital of Minneapolis is called Franklin. And she was one of the head nurses there, especially in the main um, psych ward area for those, uh, the severe patients. And she started working with me as a spiritual client. And she saw, um, cause 
my husband calls me the lavender queen. He compares me to that Frank Hotz commercial. You know how the little lady says, I put that mm on everything. He says, I'm that way with lavender. Well, I got her working with the lavender and she saw the great effects. Cause even if you do study the modern um, articles on it, proving what they knew back in ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. that lavender helps, especially when mixed with frankincense, put on the crown area of the head helps heal the sickness of the mind. Cause on the medical level, it's been proven to stop um, depression, anxiety, and give you mental clarity mm -hmm. and focus because mm -hmm. level and entities can't attach. Cause in a lot of spiritual um, cultures and religions, that's where, you know, malevolent things mostly like to attach because that's where the will sits, the penal gland, you know, that's why they always tell you, especially when you're doing working in the graveyard or working with certain type of spirits, you need to keep your head covered, you know, especially the third eye. And so she started implementing the lavender, made them change all their cleaning products to lavender scent. They even had those um, lavender aroma things, plugins and stuff. And they saw better healings with that on the, with the psychosis is, than they did with the man-made medicines because the man-made medicines just want to try to repress everything instead mm -hmm. of, you know, dealing with the core problem. I, I will tell you that I had a close family member who had uh, schizophrenia and there's an old adage in psychology, you know, by psychologists, psychiatrists, that there's no stupid schizophrenics. Most of them were valedictorians of their high school. Very, very smart people. And but th this this was a true case of schizophrenia. And so I went from looking at someone who was highly intelligent. In fact, you know, I mean, they were so far up in their career and at, at the age of 32. And I, I'll never forget that it was like a, it's like a, a switch is flipped. It happens within six weeks. It's not something that just, you know, creeps up and it's like a disease that goes a little worse every day. It's like, it's almost like a, a flipped switch. And I have a friend, uh, several of them who are psychiatrists or psychologists. And I asked one, I said, because I used to watch this person all of a sudden uh, be looking into the corners of the room and talking to what they called their angels. And I asked her, I said, do you all ever discuss the possibility that they're not insane? They're simply switching between dimensions or they're able to see the switches in dimensions so that they're actually seeing yes. things that aren't there and it, or, are there, but that we cannot see. Most of us uh, cannot see because think of the messages that they get. Mostly they're negative. They're, they're telling them to either hurt themselves usually or mm -hmm. others. And, um, and so that's why you'll see schizophrenics start walking and they found them three states over. They oh, just yeah. start walking and ask why they say it's because I'm trying to get away from the voices because oh, yeah. they're with them all of the time. So, um, and yeah. Because they're having that proper training of, of the different clairs of, you know, clear audience, you know, is being able to hear clairvoyant is being able to see, you know, clair sentient as the knowing and, um, I always forget about the smell, but because of not having, you know, because West Western medicine has separated the spiritual aspect that everything is interconnected, mind, body, and spirit. And so, you know, when you start having these gifts show up, no one's giving them proper training. They try to talk to people about it. They get told that they're crazy and they try to keep it to themselves. And so that since they don't have, like I said, that proper training of learning how to discern what is them and not them, malevolent entities love to take advantage of them because they know they don't know how to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. But then they start beating someone like me and then I start making them real. Oh my God, I'm not crazy. No, baby, you're meant to be a spiritual warrior. You have right. these gifts. So you can see and hear and smell and taste the unseen. So people who cannot, you can help protect them and be there I for them. I could I could talk with you for hours, patience. You're you're just a wealth of knowledge, but we're going to have to wrap up. But before we do, mm -hmm. I, I have one question for you because I think it's a good way to uh, to end this session, and that is, what should these young ones uh, or somebody just starting 
in this path on, on any of these types of paths where we're talking about the metaphysical, not the physical. In right. other words, if, if you believe in a God, you have to believe in the opposite. The, everything is balanced in the universe. So you have to be aware of that. What is your advice for them as far as accepting a teacher or looking for a teacher? What's a good one versus what's a bad one? What, what's some of those traits? A good teacher is not going to tell you what you have to believe. A good teacher is a person that is is a guiding lantern to show you what you already know and make you realize you've already known it all along. Because a lot of us who are into the metaphysical and spiritual and the craft, this is not our first lifetime doing it. And, you know, there's a reason why on the subconscious level, you've already been doing certain things already. And then when you learn about it, okay, that explains why I'm doing this. You're having like those, as they say, spiritual deja vu moments. Now, the predators out there are forcing you to believe a certain way, trying to extort your money. You know, you got to pay such and such, you know, exuberant amount. I mean, I'm talking about thousands of dollars to get initiated or crowned to whatever tradition it is and everything. Or um, I've seen some of the male practitioners and everything, um, you know, use it to manipulate the females into, you know, as, you know, and end up getting the poor girls end up getting essayed because, you know, they think in order to get initiated, they have to sleep with them and everything. And like I tell people, do your research and everything make sure because there's because of the internet there's so many frauds out there claiming to be something that they're not just because they want to get the money because they're working from ego or true teacher is not working for ego they're not into it because they're all about the money is because that is their calling to help teach the younger generation so they're coming up right and learning how to do right you know because trust and believe me as myself as a teacher i just don't take on anybody you know, there's certain questions I'll ask and everything. And as soon as they prove that they're just wanting to learn from, you know, because of ego and wanting to, you know, use it in a um, baneful way, you know, just to um, make themselves feel better. I ain't teaching you squat, you know. Now, I, I can tell that you are a good person and you're wanting to learn how to do it so you can make a better life for yourselves and be able to help others and be healing others. OK, I'm going to work with you and everything, you know, and for me especially a lot of the older teachers, many of them are, like I said, old school. Yes. You know, some of them have good books out there, that, but a lot of them are still old school. Like I'm the type where my babies, they keep, um, I make them, as they say, write their own books of shadows. I speak, you write. And what I teach this person is not going to be the same. I teach that person because everyone's at a different level. Mm -hmm. And mostly for me, um, majority of my students are well-seasoned practitioners of all different backgrounds. But because of me teaching the universal tools of folk magic, people are starting to realize you say tomato, I say tomato, but we're using the same tools, you know, same mm -hmm. color candles, same type of incense, same oils, same crystals. We're just calling them by different names. But when you look on how we're supposed to use them on the spiritual or metaphysical level, it's like, oh, that's, that's the same way how I use it. It's like, yeah, that's right. And that's why a lot of my, you know, people that come to me, you know, are, are different, you know, like I said, different religions and different spiritualities, because I want to, you know, show inclusively. Granted, we may work with different ancestors and different gods and goddesses, but when it comes down to it and in the core of it, we're really a lot of the same, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. How can someone get in touch with you either uh, to become a student, to get a reading, to talk more about your teas? I mean, you have so so much going on. Uh, what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you? Um, either you could um, message me um, under Patience Car on Facebook, or you can go to indigopsychics.com and... Um, contact me through there through my profile and um i either do sessions by the minute or um 30 minute sessions at a time 
All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Definitely, we're going to have you back on patience. Uh, we love you to death, and uh, thank you for your words of wisdom tonight. And we're going to be back next week, uh, so uh, tune in then. Uh, we'll have another guest for you. Uh, we're excited to be uh, doing this show and meeting all these wonderful people and, of course, uh, connecting with people we already know. Good night. Good night, y'all.